Well, hello. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Really excited about the event that we have uh, in front of us today. Uh, we have a great panel conversation that we'll be focusing on the intersection of infrastructure and climate and permitting reform. It's a great, meaty topic. Um, we have a great panel to lead us through that conversation. Uh, my name is Sasha Mackler. I am the director of the Energy Project here at the PPC. It's a program, as I'm sure you're all aware, that's focused on generating and advocating pragmatic clean energy um, uh, policies through engagement with a broad set of stakeholders and experts across a diversity of political perspectives. Uh, but before we jump into our panel conversation, we have a very special guest with us this morning, Congressman Kurt Schrader from Oregon. Uh, we're very pleased that you were able to make the journey down Pennsylvania Avenue to uh, come speak with us today. Uh, and the, the congressman is a Democrat from Oregon's 5th District. Um, he's serving in his sixth term in the House. He's a member of the Blue Dog Coalition, the New Democrat Coalition, and the Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, uh, before he was elected to Congress, uh, uh, Mr. Schrader served his state as a farmer and a veterinarian for more than 30 years. And then he was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives and the State Senate before he came to Washington. From his seat in the Energy and Commerce Committee, he has a unique perspective on this topic today that we're looking forward to hearing. Um, and as a little bit of a preview, we know that you're engaged in a bipartisan conversation right now on clean energy standard, and we look forward to hearing more about that. So welcome. So it's not exactly early in the morning, but kind of is. So I'm going to probably read most of this, and I'll apologize up front. Uh, uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, uh, being in the real world for a few years before you come to Congress, I think, is always helpful. Uh, apparently, it's not valued so much these days, but it is helpful for you guys. Uh, Bipartisan Policy Center's mission statement. You know, I think that's that's it's a great mission statement. Actively fostering bipartisanship by combining the best ideas from both parties to promote uh, health, security, opportunity for all Americans with policy solutions that are a product of informed deliberations by former elected and appointed officials, business and labor leaders, academics and advocates represent all sides of the political spectrum. And basically, the read is the uh, center prioritizes one thing above all else, and that's getting things done. That is not something that we talk about these days, for the most part. And it's sad, because that is our job, at least my job, is, I think, as United States Congressman, working for long-term solutions, which means you have to have a Republican, if you're a Democrat, to get that long-term solution. That has been lost, unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues. Used to be a bedrock principle of legislating. Uh, uh, and as I speak today, election season is now underway. You got all the presidential race in full swing. Lots of hyperbole, inflammatory rhetoric uh, that's of absolutely no use whatsoever, except to inflame the passions and drive us further apart rather than bring us together. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, working together, bipartisanship, a very boring topic apparently because the news media doesn't cover it at all. Uh, believe it or not, it is alive and well in the United States uh, Congress. <clears throat> I was elected, as uh, Sasha indicated, in 2008 after serving uh, terms of both the State House and the Senate for 12 years. I was actually able to work in veterinary medicine and sort of get my farm going while I was uh, legislating. And it, it, it informs you when you actually have to work in the community and do things, uh, uh, live by the tax code, live by the labor laws, uh, live by the environmental standards, hopefully make your play, your farm, your business uh, uh, profitable as well as sustainable for the community. It teaches you things. Uh, I remember coming to Congress in 2008, and as a new member from uh, Oregon, Oregon, I just worked in the state legislature on uh, renewable energy standards, uh, uh, emissions, and all that. And we had passed some uh, some rec some legislation. I thought, well, okay, well, what can I work with in Wash? Who can I work with in Washington D.C. on something where we're all going to be on the same page? At least the Democrats would all be on the same page, right? I said, well. You know, we're different economies, you know, uh, uh, very different attitudes on a great many things, maybe even social issues. So, no, but, you know, energy. I have, all Democrats are into renewable energy. So they, that's something. So I, I was sitting at my first caucus meeting uh, with a, a newly elected classmate of mine, uh, ex-Air Force uh, fellow John Bocherry from Ohio. 
And I said, hey, hi, I'm Kurt Schreyer. He said, hi, I'm John. And I said, hey, you know, uh, hey, you know, it's going to be great, huh? You know, we work together on sure fun. I mean, I ran on renewable energy. It's something we all have in common. And, and John looks over me and goes, what the hell are you talking about? I'm from Ohio. We're 98 percent coal. We didn't talk about any renewable energy. And I'm thinking, God damn, this is a Democrat. You know, uh, what? this is a big country. I got to rethink uh, my theology here about what's right, true, and pure for, uh, for, for everybody. Uh, it's, it's, and, and it's not just a big country and, and that. I mean, the, the, the basic economies of different parts of our country depend on a variety of different energy sources. Another good example from my standpoint is uh, when we had the blowout of Deepwater Horizon, Gulf of Mexico, a few years, well, quite a few years now. And the uh, President of the United States at that time said, well, you know what, let's hold off on, for a little bit on new permits. Let's figure out, you know, what's going on. Is there something we need to do or incorporate in uh, uh, how we do these leases and whatever? And, well, that sounds kind of reasonable. He's not shutting it down or whatever. And, uh, boy, the blowback from every single member of the Gulf Coast. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or a Democrat. They signed letters, please, Mr. President, do not shut down, do not stop leases in the Gulf of Mexico. And in talking to some of my Democratic colleagues from the Gulf of Mexico, you know, four out of five jobs depended on oil and gas. You know, so it's one thing to be all high and mighty if you're in the Pacific Northwest uh, or you got abundant hydro and you're building solar and wind and all this stuff, but it's a little different when your whole economy, your family's food on the table, your kid's education depends on, you know, that particular uh, energy sector. Uh, and frankly, you know, we've got a renaissance now in the United States. Uh, when I first came, again, we tried to do cap and trade, and I'd argue respectfully that's the single most important reason Democrats lost control in the very next election. It wasn't over the Affordable Care Act. It was on cap and trade, a, a thought that everyone was supposedly on board with when I first came to Congress, but in the course of a year and a half became anathema to some people's being. Uh, but now we have this renaissance in oil and gas. Who'd have thought, you know, 10 years ago uh, that we would be virtually energy independent, uh, that conflict with uh, the nation state of Iran would not have caused huge spikes in oil prices. It was barely a blip, you know, on the radar screen. And that's because of some of the great technology and innovation that's occurred in an energy sector that's revitalized parts of this country that were, I wouldn't say economically destitute, in pretty rough shape. If you're from North Dakota, I mean, this is a very good thing. Your economy, all of a sudden, there's, there's a bright future for you in rural parts of this country. You don't have to flock to the city uh, for, to get a good job. I mean, it's a, it's a renaissance in lots of parts of uh, the West uh, and uh, Intermountain states. So I think it's been good. It's been good for our national security also uh, these days, whether it's pharmaceuticals or energy or food sources. Uh, uh, I think it's incumbent upon every American to, to realize that while this is a world economy and certain economic advantages can occur uh, by having a lot of your, your work uh, uh, outsourced or where your customers are, there's also a well, basic component to make sure that you know, your sector uh, of the economy is protected. Uh, we had uh, recent classified briefings in the Energy and Security, uh, excuse me, Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, with regard to uh, uh, us being uh, uh, members of the committee being uh, followed and tracked uh, by some of the foreign nationals out there. Uh, good briefing on the uh, degree of. Uh, uh, cyber attacks that we see in the energy sector. You see it, obviously, you guys know, uh, the financial sector. Both those two sectors bear the brunt of that at this point in time. So where do we get our electric transformers from? China. Who else makes them? China. So it begs the question. It begs the question about energy security and how we, uh, how we actually go forward. So, you know, there are a lot, you know, this brings us to carbon emissions, obviously, and climate change. Uh, uh, it's been interesting, and just in my opinion anyway, in just the last few years, there's been a transformation in the United States Congress about the acknowledgement of the fact that climate change is indeed real. Uh, it's no longer, at least on my Energy and Commerce Committee, the thoughtful members that help dictate uh, some of the energy policy that we all hopefully live by and play into, ideally. Uh, my Republican colleagues acknowledge that climate change is there. We may disagree about 
you know, how different it is from, you know, a century ago or, you know, thousands of years ago, but it is definitely real, and people acknowledge that. So then the question becomes, well, you know, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? Because that has the opportunity and risk to change all our lives. The Midwest, the, the floods that are occurring, even in eastern Oregon, where I'm from, from you know, it's a barren, dry uh, desert, had huge floods, you know, just a month, month and a half ago that nearly wiped out, well, a dead, thank God only one death that I'm aware of, but uh, wiped out the economies of certain communities. So, you know, this is, this is real, you know, uh, uh, and people acknowledge that, at least now in the United States Congress on both sides of the aisle. How do you, how do we deal with that? Uh, so far, most of the solutions that are out there are all partisan. It's only the Democrats that are putting out any bills that uh, deal with climate change at all. Uh, you know, it's a four-letter word for a lot of my Republicans, very concerned about the electoral base back home. I get that. Uh, but I think they're acknowledging that they're all supposed to lead. Uh, their base back home is suffering in many cases with a variety of the storms that are out there. Uh, there's an opportunity to do, to do better, to do better. Uh, so uh, uh, the power sector is one of many emission sectors of our country, uh, uh, probably one of the bigger ones. It has uh, uh, the advantage from my standpoint working in the power sector that uh, there's a defined group of, of actors, uh, subject to lots of different stakeholders, mind you, but there's a defined group of, of actors that uh, are setting business policy based on consumer interest uh, and market trends. Uh, and that that has stimulated a discussion uh, uh, with, with me and, and a colleague of mine about what are the best ways to deal with uh, carbon emissions going forward. Uh, approached by uh, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, I, we actually had uh, adjacent uh, offices when I f first came to the United States Congress. And I remember distinctly that uh, my, my, I told all my team, make sure you know everyone in Congress. You may you go out, there, especially the guys right around us, go out and introduce yourself as a staff member. You're working on energy, you're working on health care, whatever it is, and get to know your counterparts across the aisle. And uh, this particular member's chief uh, at the time uh, had told his, his team the exact opposite. You know, don't work with Democrats don't work with it. And that's common. Democrats will say the same. I'm not picking on this, this particular chief. Uh, this member, when he found out, because I was talking, I said, hey, Dave, but, you know, what the heck? And he said, well, that, that's not going to happen. We're going to make sure we work with you guys. And that guy was David McKinley. You know, he said, uh, I want to work with Democrats. I want to work with Rep I work with everybody who's, you know, working on good projects. So, uh, that's valuable, and that, that's a story that's tiny, but it doesn't get told about how the members, you know, really actually do want to work together for the most part. Uh, despite what you see on TV, we actually like each other, uh, respect each other, and acknowledge the differences for the most part. And I, I'd argue respectfully that's a strength in this country. Uh, so uh, what you've got uh, uh, is a, uh, uh, a work in progress, a draft as we, we're trying to draft a piece of legislation. Uh, that gets us to near zero power emissions from the uh, carbon emissions from the power sector by 2050. Uh, this is a renewable energy Democrat working with coal country Republican. That don't happen every day in Washington, D.C., just saying. And I give a lot of credit to my colleague across the aisle for stepping up and realizing that uh, we need to put some certainty into his, his and my community's future and into the business and uh, consumer sectors about what is going on. Right now, we're at the whims of one administration or the other setting policy, you know, about what industries get favored, what industries don't, what standards are in vogue, what standards are not in vogue. I don't know how the hell, as a businessman for 30 plus years, I mean, that would kill me. I mean, I, I know where I need to go. Give me the rules of engagement. I'll go there. I'll figure it out. You know, this is America. We're very innovative. We're very thoughtful people. And the business community is unparalleled, I think, around the world with their ability to adapt and overcome. So our bill uh, tries to put some certainty into the future. We feel it's time for the United States Congress, not an executive branch, not a judicial branch, but the United States Congress, a preeminent legislative body in this country, step forward, make a clear statement, a bipartisan statement, about what our energy future in the power sector should look like with your input. We're not doing this in a vacuum. Uh, so the goal is to get nearly power-free by the middle of the century, by 2050. Uh, 
basically two key elements involved. Uh, one is uh, a big sustained period of significant federal and private sector investment in energy innovation and technology. So instead of just uh, uh, you know buying things and hoping things ev uh, you know, eventually happen, we're going to get the federal government and our colleagues, ideally subject to appropriations, uh, to make sustained investments in technology and research uh, to get this to happen in all sectors of the of the energy area. Uh, and that, as this transition, as this investment period for 10 plus years or so goes, uh, we will be transitioning to a clean energy standard that you and everyone else will know we're going to up front. So you can base your decisions in your world as a consumer or as a business person about what's actually going to be happening. Uh, it's a bit of a reach. It's a bit of a reach, let's be honest. Uh, but it is the only bipartisan solution that I know of anyway that's out there to get us somewhere. And it's in uh, a rough form at this point. Again, we're going to try and uh, uh, work closely, and we are already working closely with a lot of folks in the industry and environmental groups. We've got uh, some environmental folks uh, already on board. This isn't the first time this type of approach has ever happened. I remind you all that uh, recently the Energy and Commerce Committee, a couple of Congresses ago, uh, reauthorized TSCA. You know, it used to be extremely divisive, you know, industry, ke chemistry council on one side, environmentalists on the other. You know, one, one didn't know what the hell the standards were. The other thought the standards were ineffective and non-enforceable. And the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, and industry and environmental folks came together, and we rewrote the TOS TOSCA law just to Congress go in, I'd argue, one of the highly partisan divisive periods in American history. So it can happen. I'd also go back to 1972 with the Clean Water Act, took the approach we're taking right now. Uh, it just didn't change the standards overnight and say, good luck, you know, rural America, hopefully you can meet all these new EPA standards uh, at the end of the day. It created a multi-billion dollar fund, roughly $26 billion in today's uh, uh, standards that applied, uh, allowed for grants and then loans after 1987, though primarily it was loans. Uh, loans to municipalities covered like 75% of the capital costs of new water treatment plants. This is very similar to what we're actually proposing here today. So what we're trying to do is not prejudge the source of the energy sector. We are prejudging that all these energy sectors have to get to near zero emissions by 2050 and show a clear path towards that, uh, in the at least within the first 10 years of uh, our, our investment. So you know, we've got a lot of faith in uh, uh, the American ingenuity, the ability to adapt and respond. Uh, I know our environmental community uh, regularly expects great standards and changes in automobile uh, uh, emission te uh, technology, power plant technology. So we're just continuing on that same trend. And we know the business community also values that. That's how you stay ahead of your competitor. That's how you actually you know, deliver clean uh, energy uh, going forward. So I know it's systems, it's, uh, it's complex, uh, uh, but I think this is probably uh, uh, more than overdue at this point in time. Using a clean energy standard as opposed to just the heavy hand of uh, EPA at the whim of whatever president comes along, uh, I think is, makes a lot better sense for the country. Uh, again, I think it's good for every American, it's good for businesses. Uh, and I think it's a model that uh, we can reproduce. We're, we're dealing with the power sector only at this point in time, but if we're successful in bringing people together, uh, I think there's a great opportunity to mirror this type of approach uh, in transportation and all sorts of other sectors that, that we need also to get to, to near zero to really turn this climate back to where it needs to be. So uh, with that, uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's exciting times. Uh, we're looking forward to it. We've got good groups engaged. We'd love to get your engagement. If you're interested, please contact uh, David's or my office. Uh, we'd love to have your input as we get into the finer details uh, going forward. But there is hope out there. It's through bipartisanship, Democrats, Republicans working together. Thank you. So question or two? Yes, sir. Yeah, we got Mike coming. Not really. Tom Turner with the Boss Report. Uh, on bipartisanship, um, I understand your point. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on the state and federal uh, conflicts we're seeing on the states.
Sure. Well, uh, we'll probably get into details uh, as we develop the legislation, but the goal here is to have a federal standard so that the state's uh, industry and the environmental community and consumer what's expected of them. That would be huge. Uh, I hear all the time that, uh, you know, state of California has got this standard, state of Texas has got a different standard, and that's, you know, frankly, when you're dealing with interstate commerce and particularly with energy where uh, the electron knows no state boundaries, that it's ridiculous to have all these different state standards. Uh, we should have one standard nationally. If a state wants to do better than that, that's, all, I guess, always an opportunity. We never preclude that at the federal level. But at least there be a consistent standard that everyone could count on. And if you're a consumer, I mean, I, I see this in the food products industry all the time as a as a farmer and as a member of the ENC committee dealing with FDA where uh, you get all these labels that are kind of one-offs, natural, almost natural, organic, pretty much organic. I mean, come on, man. It's like being half pregnant, you know. And uh, I think that the, the American consumer in the world uh, is looking forward to having an opportunity to have a standard that we could be going towards. The other side benefit that I did mention with having – uh, these clean energy standards and this huge investment in technology, uh, particularly, frankly, in carbon capture, carbon sequester. I talked to some Democratic engineering colleagues of mine, and they're talking about capturing carbon out of the atmosphere in the near future. I think that's going to happen. I think that's going to happen. You know, that changes the whole dynamic of this, I think, going forward. And then the biggest thing is these American companies, we could export that technology overseas. You know, it's not just about America. We've got to have India on board. We've got to have China on board. They're building coal plants. I don't know how many a week at this point in time. So there, I think it makes good sense for if you're really interested in climate change, if that's your real goal, let's have the technology to back it up around the world. I'm getting off easy. All right, it's early in the morning. Thank you guys very, very much. All right. Well, thank you for those remarks, um, uh, uh, Congressman, and really thank you for your leadership in trying to drive a bipartisan solution to this challenge, which we know is going to require be, be required to really create an enduring uh, policy framework for the country. Um, and as we think about this sort of broader framework on on climate, you know, I want to maybe now we'll. Uh, pivot to sort of the flip side of that, which is how do we keep the current economy moving as we transition to a clean economy? And I think that really starts to, uh, you know, uh, uh, come to a head when we think about infrastructure. N not only the new infrastructure we're going to need to site and build uh, at an enormous pace and scale to transition the economy, but also uh, how do we keep the oil and gas industry and the current sectors of the economy growing and in a healthy way as we move, shift to a cleaner economy. And our entry point to that conversation will be the National Petroleum Council study um, that has just been completed uh, that really represents you know, an enormous amount of work with over 300 organizations uh, that took place over the last year and a half or so that really focused on this question of infrastructure. Um, uh, the BPC was really involved in this, as were many others, and we have a great panel today that can talk about this. Uh, and the conclusions of the MPC and then maybe tie it to some of the other things that are happening uh, with respect to NEPA and permitting reform. Uh, one thing to note as we, um, as we kick off the conversation is that the MPC affirmatively called for a national climate policy as part of their recommendations, and this is really the first time it's taken that step. So I think that's uh, really a good basis to, to uh, start our conversation today. So let me introduce our panel. Why don't you all come on up and we'll kick things off. Thank you. Um, as we get started, maybe we'll start here at the, to my immediate left with Amy Harder. You all are probably familiar with her, but you know, she's a national energy and environmental reporter for Axios. Um, she writes a regular column there called The Harder Line, um, and which really focuses on national, mostly national energy and environmental trends. Prior to Axios, she covered these same issues for the Wall Street Journal and the National Journal. Uh, and Amy was also the inaugural journalism fellow at the Universi University of Chicago's Energy Policy Institute. To Amy's left, we have Alan Armstrong, um, who is the CEO of the Williams Companies. Um, he became president and chief executive of Williams in January of 2011. Uh, he joined Williams in 1998 as an engineer. Um, 
And as you're all probably uh, familiar with Williams, they handle about 30 percent of the natural gas across the United States that is used every day, more than half of New York City's natural gas, and nearly 90 percent of Washington State's gas. As a member and leader of the uh, National Petroleum Council, Alan chaired the Energy Infrastructure Study, which we'll hear more about today. Uh, uh, moving on down the panel, we have Marty Durbin, who is the president of the U.S. Chamber's uh, Global Energy Institute. Marty's recently taken on this leadership role uh, and to really focus on common sense energy solutions. A lot of experience and history in this area. Uh, he previously served as the executive vice president and chief strategy officer at the American Petroleum Institute and as president and CEO of America's Natural Gas Alliance. Uh, he started his career as a legislative assistant for Senator Alan Dixon and also for Rep Rep Representative Rick Boucher. Uh, last but not least, my close colleague, uh, Jason Grumet, who is the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Jason has 20 years of experience really working at the intersection of science, policy, and politics at the uh, at both the state and the national level. Um, before BPC, Jason founded and directed the National Commission on Energy Policy, which produced a comprehensive set of energy policy recommendations, many of which were incorporated in the 2005 Energy Policy Act and subsequent 2007 Energy Security Act. Um, well, with that, I think you, we're all anticipating a great conversation here. I'll turn it over to Amy to kick things off. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Shasha, for that great introduction. And thank you, for everybody, for being here in person and for those tuning in on the live stream. Uh, I want to say thank you to Jason for hosting this event. I've done a few events here with you, and it's, and it's, always, been, <laughs> it's always been a good, good conversation. Uh, I want to sort of bridge some of the congressman's remarks with uh, the National Environmental Policy Act discussion. And so we'll have a discussion up here for a little bit, but then I'll be throwing it out to you. So I hope you're saving all of your tough questions that you didn't ask the congressman for us. Uh, so please be thinking of that. Um, but actually, first, I have two questions for you in the audience uh, to kind of get a sense of the crowd. Uh, so raise your hand if you think that bipartisanship is needed for big energy and climate policy, or do you think Democrats, because it's probably going to be Democrats, could push it through without, um, without any Republicans? So first raise your hand if you think bipartisanship is essential. It's a hometown crowd, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now don't be shy. If you think Democrats can do it alone, raise your hand. I'm sure somebody thinks it, and now they just don't want to raise their hand. <laughs> so I'll raise my hand to be, to be the odd woman out. Um, the next question is, raise your hand if uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, is something that you have to deal with uh, in your daily job. OK, so a little bit fewer hands up. So that gives you a sense of how wonky we can get with NEPA. That's the only acronym I'm going to allow on stage. Uh, but Alan, I, I want to start with you. Uh, so as CEO of a major uh, oil and gas and infrastructure company, you've been at the center of many of the battles that we've talked about, uh, New York being one of the, the latest ones, and the, up and down the Atlantic Coast seaboard. Of course, you've also chaired this recent study um, at the National Petroleum Council. For those who don't know, it's an advisory council of the US Energy Department. Uh, can you fill us in about what was the, the biggest upshot of this study, and what do you hope happens, becomes of this study, other than just you know collecting dust on a bookshelf? Sure. Well, certainly, I think uh, the largest and from a political perspective, probably most important conclusion that came out of there was very clear and concise recommendations on NEPA reform as well as affirmative position by the National Petroleum Council uh, and the, particularly the study as well, affirming the fact we do need a national policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so really, the coupling of those two issues, and I think it's important the way the recommendations came out, I think it's important that both of those proceed for the benefit of, of being able to improve uh, uh, permitting. But as well, there's a lot of really interesting findings about what has actually gone on and what is actually occurring within both uh, the cost of energy to uh, consumers here in the U.S. and to our industries, as well as the amount of CO2 emissions reductions that have occurred. And so maybe just some quick facts on that. First of all, from 2009 to 2019, uh, we see that the price of the city gate for natural gas to 
to, which is basically at the wholesale level before it goes uh, into the local distribution companies. The price of that is dropped in half for consumers on the backs mostly of non-conventional resources as well as additional infrastructure. Our major industries have also seen, so chemical production, food production, paper production, have also seen the cost of energy in that time frame drop in half. And for most of those uh, industries, when you think about how commoditized those industries are, dropping their energy cost in half is their margin. And so, said another way, if it wasn't for those advantages, we would be losing a lot of those businesses to overseas. And in reality, we've been able to bring a lot of that industry back here at home where we can decide to do it in a clean, responsible way. And so we're taking control of those industries by having them here at home. Um, and as well, uh, on the CO2 emissions reduction, I find this really fascinating that from, in a study from 05 to 2017, uh, every single year we have increased the CO2 reductions and from 06 when that study first, the first full year of that study through 17, a tenfold decrease in CO2 reduction all on the backs of natural gas. Um, and in fact, each of those years, the amount of reduction has been much higher from natural gas being employed in electric generation than it has been in, uh, from renewables. So we have a lot of opportunity to reduce emissions by getting infrastructure, by utilizing our low-cost natural gas here. And I, I am hopeful that the study brings forward the concept that we can lower emissions without completely stopping the use of fossil fuels. And today it's almost become religious in terms of this no fossil fuels or fossil fuels as opposed to a real concerted effort of experts and scientists saying let's reduce our emissions and let's reduce it as fast as we can. And the fastest way to reduce our emissions is by getting the infrastructure and by getting our lower carbon fuels into our mix today and continue to do that. So I think it found some really interesting, and people call it middle ground, I would call it a path forward. Um, and so it's one thing to talk about the far left, the far right, neither one of those are probably sustainable, but we do have a path forward and I think that's identified in the study. So what does this study say specifically about climate change? Do you chart a particular policy way forward? What are some options that you think uh, could be acceptable? Well, I think, you know, the, the study refers to uh, um, a national policy that would be comprehensive it would be um, uh, economy-wide, it would be considering all sources, it would uh, be certainly um, uh, market-based and transparent, um, as well as technology agnostic, and I think that's really important to not pick winners and losers in that. Um, and then finally, be internationally competitive, so it doesn't do a whole lot of good to reduce our emissions if we just push the responsibility for manufacturing and industry to the rest of the world and don't keep it here at home. So I think, uh, so those are kind of the, the boundaries that are set or the requirements. That's, that is motherhood and apple pie. I'll be the first to admit that that's all really nice to have. It doesn't, the study did not try to go as far as saying exactly how that should occur. Why didn't it? Um, well, first of all, I think to have done so, we would be in our year 10 of the study if we would have chosen to do that. Uh, and is that because there's, there, would, there would have been disagreement? There, there's a very diverse group of the National Petroleum Council, and I'm proud of that. I think, you know, that was really the strength of this study was all the diverse opinions that were in the group. But I think that it would have been, it was, I can tell you, it was challenging to get agreement on that. And while I'm very proud of that agreement, I think, uh, we, we are laying, I think, the groundwork for Congress to do their work um, and continue to, to encourage uh, a national policy on that, but I, I don't think we were in any, any position to actually describe a specific policy. So I want to uh, put a pin in that and come back to it in a couple of minutes, but a quick lightning round question for the panelists, and you can just answer by a raise of hands, just like <laughs> the audience did. So as, as all of us probably know, given um, the wonkiness level of this crowd, uh, <laughs> President Trump recently proposed sweeping changes to NEPA. A uh, quick raise of hands of the panelists. By and large, do you support those changes? 
And I understand uh, that one big change was that the NEPA process would exclude cumulative impacts, um, which many people interpreted as excluding climate change. So how do you, uh, I guess, Jason, I'm going to put you on the spot. How do you, as an org organization that, of course, prioritizes action on climate change, how do you square that with, um, with this part of the NEPA re reform at the administration? Delighted. Welcome, everybody. Um, well, so I think I just want to add one sentence to what Alan was saying about the significance of this agreement, and that is that the major independent oil producers for the first time came out and said, we want mandatory national action on climate change. Active voice, not if it happens, it should look like. And I think that, if you've really been paying attention to the politics of climate change, was meaningful. On the question of NEPA, um, we look at it in terms of what I think Congressman Schrader was saying about what will actually be required to address the problem. We focus now a lot on the scale of the problem. We're just beginning to now start to think about the scale of the solution. And I think Sasha alluded to this, but over the next 25 years, if we take ourselves seriously and actually believe that we need to have net zero emissions across the economy, we have to invest trillions of dollars in offshore wind, onshore wind, transmission, sequestration, battery storage, advanced nuclear power, direct air capture. I mean, a fundamental restructuring of the entire U.S. economy and energy system. Our current regulatory structure does not tolerate success. We will invent these technologies. I am confident that a significant infusion of $100, $200 billion of federal resources will actually come up with those technologies. I have absolutely no confidence that we will deploy them at scale in time to make a difference. And so if that is your actual framework, you become much less concerned about the politics around a particular pipeline or transmission line. You actually think about the national and global imperative to fix the problem. And with that framework, I am willing to tolerate lots of little things that I find unnecessary, right? So guess what? The administration overachieved in its deregulatory enthusiasms, right? They made a bunch of changes to NEPA that aren't really necessary, aren't really important, and probably just make it more vulnerable to litigation because they were trying to make the point that they wanted kind of climate out of the discussion. That was unnecessary, it was unfortunate, but rather than focusing on their intent, I think it's actually more important to focus on what the actual goal is, which is to make the ability to build big stuff in this country possible again. We need industrial strength greenhouse gas reductions, and that's going to require shaking things up a little bit. Do you think Trump is the right leader for that? He, he openly despises wind, for example. The Interior Department is slowing down the permitting process for offshore wind right as they say they're going to speed it up. So this funny thing about democracy is you get a president and you kind of have to make that process work. Um, I think it's really unfortunate that the administration has infused this sense of kind of malintent towards climate in what I think is actually an important change to the structure of our regulatory system, because I think that just stimulates the kind of reflexive opposition. I think something Alan said is really important, which is it's one thing to say, no, it's not effective to solve the climate problem by fighting over individual projects. But it only matters if you say, yes, there's a better way to do this. And so I think the fact that the administration is only focusing on one part of the equation makes it much less likely to be successful than if it was actually kind of a program towards modernity and says, how do we, in fact, build not only the transportation infrastructure, but the energy infrastructure to decarbonize the economy? So no, I don't think the president's the greatest messenger on climate solutions. <laughs> That's the, the full quote from today's event. <laughs> and Jason knows I, I do often quote him, so maybe you'll see that tomorrow in our, in our newsletter, you which you all should sign up for if you're not. Um, Marty, I want to bring you into the conversation. The U.S. Chamber has really, uh, as, as I've written, evolved somewhat on its position and certainly rhetoric with climate change. Uh, but staying here on NEPA for just one more moment, I under understand that you guys, as you just mm -hmm. shown, uh, are supporting the administration on this, but are wanting to do, wanting uh, there to be more action on this front. So how do you sort of, uh, how do you see Trump's aggressive regulatory rollbacks, including this NEPA reform? How does that make your job harder as, a, as an industry uh, group that supports Trump but says you want to do more? I, I think putting on my, my critic hat, I think it, it, it's hard to believe that you want more when you issue positive statements with what the administration is doing. Well, I, I guess I would start by saying that the, 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 the regulatory changes we've been seeing coming out of this administration are changes that 
many of industries have been have been working on for decades and working on with administrations of both parties are they happening now yes they are and with respect to NEPA you know this administration started very early on in, in you know in, in, in 2017 uh, and it's and it's not while I agree with everything uh, uh, Jason was saying about you know we need this permitting reform to be able to do the big things with, with regard to climate let's not forget we need it for every other every other infrastructure uh, uh, project out there as well and you know the chamber and Tom Donnie have been saying for years that you know, it shouldn't take longer to get yes or no on a project than it takes to actually build the project <clears throat> so timing and who you know who the president is at the time this is something we need to have done in order to you know, to do the big things we have to do across the board so as we've talked about and, and Congressman Schrader also shared is that NEPA is really just a, a, a small part of this bigger debate of energy and climate change and what the U.S. government and state and local governments should do as well. So broadening out this conversation a little bit, another lightning round question, so yes or no. Um, does the government need to create a new economy-wide policy to address climate change, yes or no? To, and we can do raise of hands, that, that's simpler. I, I thought you wanted the hands, but I'll say, I'll say yes, and either way, I'll raise my hand and say yes. 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 So that really limits the world of potential policies somewhat, unless somebody is going to invent a policy that none of us know about. Let's talk a little bit about Congressman Schrader and McKinley's proposal, a clean energy standard. Is that something that you could support? And I'm not asking you, to, I know you're not going to come out in front of your, your, your boards and, and other colleagues to say you support it now, but to what, to what extent is that something you could support? Why or why not? And what concerns would you have? Alan? Well, first of all, um, you know, I haven't read the details of it, so. Well, you haven't missed it because the details yeah, have not yet been yeah, written. Yeah, good, good. So, good. So I'm glad I'm, glad I'm not behind on that. Washington likes to talk about things that haven't actually yeah. been introduced yet. So, but, but, I do, but I do think this is one of the challenges. And so what, what I really like to hear from Congressman Shader was his bipartisan approach and to try to move things forward. So that's very encouraging to me, period. What is concerning to me is exactly that we have very we have a lot of very pragmatic opportunities sitting in front of us right now right here to reduce emissions and we are not taking advantage of those because we're not permitting an infrastructure and so that to me if you think about you know in the business world you're always thinking about present value so it's always how do we how do we uh, think about dollars coming in the door today? We ought to be thinking about if we're really concerned about climate change, we ought to be thinking about emissions we can reduce right here, right now. And while we're stepping over the top of those, reaching for this zero carbon emission in 2050, we are continuing to unnecessarily put emissions in the air today. And those are the things that we should be really tackling right now. So. So yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the theoretical approach to the future, but why in the world are we stepping over the top of great opportunities to reduce emissions right now? That, that's the part for me as a businessman, as a pragmatist, that is really concerning to me. So it sounds like you're not willing to take, to even comment on a, on a general scale whether or not you could support something like a clean energy standard. Is that right? I, I would just say, well, I, I think having standards is, is a great idea, but I think having pragmatic ways of, of approaching that is more important. And, and said it another way, if you gave me the option of should we be capturing emission reduction opportunities that are right here, right now, or should we be designing something for 2050, I would say we probably ought to be doing both. But for God's sake, don't step over the one that's right in front of us. But you also say you want a, an economy-wide government policy right. to reduce emissions. That's right. So I'll come back to that in a moment. I think Jason. Congressman Schrader and McKinley are doing something kind of interesting just to step back for a minute. And it, the fundamental question is how much you lean on innovation and how much you lean on regulation. And so in the halcyon days of carbon pricing, the notion was economists rule, make the prices right, and innovation will follow. So you basically drive the argument with price, and you let science happen. I think we're seeing a little bit of a shift now in people saying, well, look, I kind of want to know a little more about what this stuff's going to cost and is it going to work, and so let's put more emphasis on innovation. Now, you can take that too far also, because I think right now the enthusiasm around innovation has this notion of if we invest some money at RPE, good stuff will just happen. Technology doesn't scale itself. 
So it really is a question of when and how you sequence innovation and regulation. I think if what Congressman Schrader is saying is before we just drop down a mandate and say we're going to have 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent non-carbon energy, we want to have a period of really intense concentrated investment in those technologies. What's interesting though is they are acknowledging that then you might need deployment, right? You're not just going to say let's throw money at RPE and hope it works. The premise is just to push innovation first, recognizing that regulation will then probably have to follow. And I think that is conceptually a different kind of space that has the potential for more of a bipartisan agreement. Marty, uh, going back to you and, and the Chamber's evolving positions, I understand that you guys are uh, issuing a key vote um, for the, the Senate energy bill that's on the floor this week. Many of you may be following. It's a huge bill, 555 pages, which I think is bigger or about the same as the two last big energy bills that Congress has done in 2005 and 2007. So it's certainly big, although I don't think there's as big of policies in this bill as there was in those. For example, there's no ethanol mandate uh, being created, uh, which is probably for the better, uh, according to most people. And <laughs> we'll see if any ethanol people are in the audience. Uh, I hope they'll ask a question. Uh, but we were talking earlier, and please expound upon this, you, you think more needs to be done with, this, um, with climate change, that you don't think this is, Congress will be done after this bill potentially passes this week. Can you talk about the shift within the chamber? And, and to respond to the, the critics who say that this is just a shift in rhetoric and does, isn't going to include any significant calling for a big new policy. Sure. Well, the chamber about a year ago did, you know, shift, shifted its approach you know, to climate, boil it down. Yes, it's real. Yes, we're contributing. And inaction is not an option. Where the Global Energy Institute in the chamber has focused a lot of its attention is on that on the innovation piece of this. Can I just interrupt there really sure. quick? Do you think that's a little bit? You guys are a little bit behind the times with that. I mean, the world has. They're been... walking up, right? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just you know climate change being a problem, and I'll, I'll let you decide where we are on the on, on, on the timeline. But that's where we are, and I think we're in, and now the, the the you know the next question. So now what? And so you know we, we've got we've focused on the innovation side, energy, energy innovates program. We did the summit last summer, uh, and we've now engaged with the broad membership of the chamber. We've got a task force on climate actions that you know not just those in the energy space. Or, you know, we, we've got we've got you know every sector that's represented by the chamber now working with us on specific you know uh, work streams so that we can learn more about how are the existing policies and anticipated policies coming along and going to affect their their operations how are they addressing it now one of the things we pulled around was the use of internal carbon pricing and a lot of work's already been done in that space but it's it's allowing us to now how how do we position the chamber to be a much stronger voice in you know, in in the climate discussion on behalf of the broad business community. So as you mentioned, you know the the, the, the innovation bill the, that's uh, the, that's up in the Senate now. We did we, we there was a key vote on that last night just for the you know the motion to proceed, which passed 84 to three. To, you know, to Jason's point, you know, we recognize we know that innovation. There's not an innovation genie that comes along and now solves everything. You know, you've got to focus there. But now, what's going to what's going to pull those technologies through to deployment, uh, commercialization? Well, the business community is the group. There, you know, the private sector that's going to fund that, that's going to deploy it, that's going to you know, that that's going to make it available in a global context, <clears throat> so that. We can now, if we're you know, addressing the, the, you know, the global climate challenge, do we have reliable and affordable energy technologies that can be deployed around the world? I mean, that's the, the developing world is, you know, is going to continue to, the, the, the energy demand is going to continue to grow. And we're in a great position to be able to help meet that demand with fewer emissions uh, and in an affordable way. And I think that. We certainly have leaned to the let's get the innovation going here and provide the incentives and the encouragement and the and the and the federal role in that research and development. But the next step's got to be now. How do what do we need? What do we need in place to help pull these technologies through? So the chamber has supported an increase in the gasoline tax for quite some time. Uh, that's to fund infrastructure, though, which is somewhat uh, interrelated um, but separate from climate change and, and carbon dioxide emissions. Tell us about the conversations that are happening about to what degree the chamber could ever support a tax on carbon dioxide. 
or all yeah. greenhouse gases. On the, on the infrastructure, you're right. Uh, the chamber's had a long-standing uh, uh, position supporting a, as much as a quarter. You know, add 25 cents to, you know, to the gas tax. You think from, from an infrastructure standpoint, that benefits everybody. And, um, you know, with regard to a price on carbon, the, the, the shifting dialogue you know, within our membership, and you see, we, we do have a lot of companies that are already clearly saying they're for a price on carbon. Guess what? There are a lot of others that don't. And so... Which one's winning, though? Which, which camp has... has it's not a matter of winning or losing. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're able to have that dialogue uh, now. I mean, clearly, we don't have a consensus among the members. So we don't support a price on carbon at the moment. We're also not opposing one. And we're not, not up lobbying against uh, a, a carbon tax uh, of any kind. But that's where, you know, we've got to look, where, where does the, the business community need to be in this, in this debate? And whether that debate's going to take place here in Congress, some of the global dialogue going on, or at the state level, we want the U.S. Chamber to be a, a constructive and positive voice in that, in that dialogue. Alan, I want to come back to you. The, some of the words that you used to describe the type of economy-wide policy, transparent, market-based, all-encompassing, fair. I think if there's any economists in the room, they would jump up and down and scream, that's a carbon tax. Uh, do you support a carbon tax? Um, boy, I need to be better prepared for this question. But um, I would just say that you know, carbon tax can take a lot of forms. In fact, a gasoline tax is a carbon tax. So if you really think about it. So at the end of the day, though, what is going to have to happen for reduce emissions is to impact the consumer's behaviors. So people think about the, people's electric vehicles as being non-emission. Well, that's just not the case in today's world. When you're, when you're driving a Tesla, you have a lot of emissions, depending on which area you're uh, vehicles being charged and you have a lot of emissions to be accountable for and so people don't like to hear that because they think that's an easy button they can push but in reality they are taking on a lot of emissions when they make that choice and so we that is my, my suggestion is whether we what label we want to put to it isn't different to me but it's got to affect consumer behavior because at the end of the day it's not going to be the big bad oil company that is faced with this issue, it's going to be consumers' behavior that is really going to change emissions reductions. And so that's something we all have to get used to. We all want it to be somebody else's responsibility, but it's not going to be. It's going to be all of ours if we're really going to reduce emissions. So is it correct to say that you don't have a position on a carbon tax? I, I don't have a specific idea about a carbon tax. No. I once spoke to a room full of oil and gas officials, and I did the, the clapping uh, method to see what, who supported what. And I said, clap your hands if you support a carbon tax, and nobody clapped their hands. And then I said, clap your hands if you don't support a carbon tax, and nobody clapped their hands. <laughs> and then I said, clap your hands if you don't want to tell me what your position is on a carbon tax. And everybody <laughs> clapped their hands. And that's where we are now. Uh, oil and gas companies don't want to say, or all, lots of corporate officials don't want to say where they are on a, on a carbon tax. And I think that's because some of them actually support it but are afraid to come out, and some don't support it and are afraid to come out to say it publicly. So it's certainly interesting. Well, I, I, just to be clear, I'm not avoiding the a response to the general issue. My concern is carbon tax. A ask everybody in this room what carbon tax means, and you'll get a different answer. And so I think the reluctance to respond to that is there's not clarity about what that means. If you say, do you want a policy that, that addresses all those issues we named? Absolutely. Is that a carbon tax? I don't know. I would yeah, add here, too. I mean, it's a perfectly fair question. But I also think that it, it's, it, we've got to get away from, well, are you for, for this or not? Where, we, where we're right now, again, I think the, the innovation bill on the, on the Senate floor is not only something that will, will make significant progress on, on climate and energy technology, but to the congressman's point about what he's doing with Congressman McKinley, I think that we've also got to look at, the, at, at how important it is that, that Senator Murkowski and Senator Manchin have been able to stitch together 50 different bills that all had bipartisan support. They moved them through the committee. They've now put, put them all together. They're getting time agreement for amendments on the floor. 
as I mentioned at breakfast, these are muscles they haven't used in a long time. And we're going to need them to use those muscles to come up with whatever the solution is, which is another reason I think we've got such a broad coalition supporting that effort. Everyone from the U.S. Chamber to EDF and, and the Nature Conservancy and lots of other industries that are, you know, that, that are uh, represented in town here. So I don't think we can lose sight of how important it is that we're, and the NPC study, I think, fits right into creating that path forward, as Alan was talking about. So, Amy, you wrote this total buzzkill piece of <laughs> earlier this week, last week, I lost track of time, saying, like, look, it's just, you know, I don't see any pathway towards climate change over the next couple of years. And I know I don't get to ask the moderator questions, but... Um, <laughs> but he is. This is a moderated discussion. <laughs> but there question. are, you know, there are some rationale for some optimism in a democracy. And it doesn't go from zero to carbon tax. But the fact that we have the Republican leader coming out with a climate solution in three phases, and, you know, is a trillion trees the answer? Well, no. Aggressive but gardening, as I quoted. It's a I want to wipe that from your memory. Because <laughs> it, what matters is now, and I think Alan said this, we are trying to solve the problem. And that's when math starts to matter. And once people get seduced into actually recognizing that there is a global crisis that they need to be part of solving, that at least puts you in the game. The focus on more investment innovation is pulling people together. The fact that the, you know, there's a battle in the environmental community right now between let's just stop stuff, which is a strong voice, and others who recognize that as long as the implication is that solving the climate problem means avoiding modernity, like you get no creds in that debate. So you're starting to see people actually start to have that fight openly. And it's not an easy debate. And so I guess the, you know, it's kind of a question of what's your theory of change in a democracy? A lot of my friends in the kind of ENGO movement and a lot of folks on the right are really happy to keep the fight going because we've been at it for so long. It's kind of ingrained in our DNA. I've had friends say when they hear that, you know, Republicans are moving on climate to dismiss it because, well, they're just doing it because they've seen the polling. Right? That's how a democracy is supposed to work, right? The people who vote for them want to see them act. So I think that's durable and good. And I also think you're starting to see people get past the idea that people need to apologize before moving forward. You know, I think that there has been this sense, and, you know, you and others and I occasionally um, summon that kind of cynicism of saying, well, do they really mean it or are they just taking a step forward? Yes. Right? I mean, yes. <laughs> like, that, that is, in fact, how we all start to kind of evolve. And so, you know, I think obviously a tremendous amount depends on what happens today and the next few months. But we take the point of view that regardless of who the president is, what can pass Congress is probably pretty similar. We're going to have a closely divided Congress. And I think there is an opportunity for a first range of legislation kind of building on what's happened in the Senate, which is not going to be sufficient to address the scale of the problem, but puts us into a position where Congress might have the political capacity then. So I mean, it's just going to be a couple of steps, I think, before we can do anything consequential enough to say we have a national policy that meets the conditions that Alan, I think, described. And I'm certainly no, you know, I obviously was a reporter. I don't take positions on anything. And I did a column a couple of weeks ago about how carbon tax is probably never going to happen. And I think it's notable that Congressman Schrader is not talking about a carbon tax, even though I would argue, and I'm, I'm guessing many people here would agree, that a clean energy standard is just another way to price carbon, albeit less efficiently, uh, although more politically palpable. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the election. Uh, I'm sure some of us are following it, uh, maybe. Uh, I somehow don't love politics, but I've somehow found myself in the city for 12 years. But talking with people like Jason makes it easier. Oh, uh, but be, one important constituency that we don't have represented up here uh, on this on this panel is uh, the, in, the environmental activist community. And it is growing more and more influential in the debate, particularly with the Democratic Party. Uh, these activists from the Sunrise Movement and Bill McKibben, Greta Thunberg, of course, they're all having an incredible influence on the debate. And they're pulling the, the Democratic Party to the left. And, and this is due to a whole host of uh, factors, um, climate change becoming a more urgent and present problem, uh, renewable energy becoming cheap, cheaper. It's all part of one big puzzle. But these activists are becoming really influential, and that's pulling the party to the, the Democratic Party to the left, and it's pulling Republicans back into having to, to talk about it at all. And so, because we don't have an activist on the stage, I want to sort of 
put that hat on and, and ask a question that I suspect they may ask or yelling about it on Twitter as we speak. Um, why should anybody take seriously these, these comments from you guys when you don't appear to be supporting any sort of big substantive policy, maybe not out to 2050, but even 20, 20, 2025 or 2030 emission reductions? If you're not supporting any new concrete policy with goals uh, and you're not pushing back on the incredible um, regulatory rollback of climate change by this administration, I'm just saying that's what they're saying. So what would be your response to that? Alan? Uh, well, first of all, I think we've spoken pretty clearly from the National Petroleum Council saying that we do want affirmatively, do believe that we need a national policy on greenhouse gas emissions. I think to say, well, you don't have a very specific goal in mind is, um, I think we've laid out clearly what we think needs to be addressed. I don't think it would be all that constructive, frankly, for us to try to describe exactly what that is because we don't have the political constituency to, to describe the way Congress does. So, um, so I, I think we have been pretty clear, frankly, that we do support that. And, and I don't think that we were looking for just NEPA reform without that, because we think both things are important to drive our economy forward. The concerns around emissions that the public has needs to be addressed. And, but we need to take that concern, which is an overarching concern, we need to take that out of the individual infrastructure permitting process and that is very clean and very simple. So in other words, if, if we came out and said, well, what we want is we want a permitting process that has clear, certain, unambiguous path to get infrastructure built, and that's all we're looking for. We're not looking to get around uh, the impact on species, the impact on water quality, the impact on air quality. We are not asking to get away from the responsibilities to reduce the impact on the environment as we build the infrastructure. We simply want a clean, clear process that has all the agencies in their swim lanes. That doesn't ask, seem like a big ask from my perspective. The only reason you would be against that is because you want a bureaucratic mess that keeps us from moving ahead with any permitting because that's your tool for addressing climate change. That is not an effective tool for addressing climate change. So I guess just getting back to answer your question, um, I don't think that we're in any position to describe exactly how, uh, how, we ought to, how the policy ought to accomplish greenhouse gas emissions, but we are very affirmative that we need it and we want it. Marty, the chamber has, some critics who say, a somewhat tortured past with climate change. It was in 2009, an official said he wanted to have a, a, a debate, a trial of sorts on climate science. You guys have definitely moved beyond that. But how do you reassure your critics that you guys are serious about this? Well, they'll judge us on our actions and what we're doing as far as getting out on, whether it's the innovation bill here, supporting other bills like the HFC phase out. But, but to get to your question, I mean, I, I, I'd answer it in two ways. Number one, in the absence of, a, of, of a, a comprehensive national program over the last 10 years, the United States has reduced carbon emissions more than any other country in the world. Is it sufficient? No. But it was driven by technology innovation <clears throat> that, that, that allowed us to get here. Um, I think also what you've got to, to start looking at is in the again, absence of, Look at what, the, what industries and companies are doing on their own and the pledges they are making. You've seen the shifts just in the last few years, when the, certainly in the oil and natural gas sector, and, and their participation in the NPC study, I think, was, is you can't understate the, what, what they were able to accomplish as far as coming out with a, with a common, uh, common position there. But electric utilities making commitments for 50% reduction by 2030, get to zero by 2050. So what do we do now from a policy standpoint to you know, provide a tailwind, help, you know, help move all that forward in a way that uh, uh, you know, is more you know, market-based. Hey, obviously, with the chamber, we're big fans of free enterprise, and we think that that is what has been driving a lot of the, the progress we're making. So I, I, some, sometimes the, the, the debate gets, it sounds incredibly dire, and it is, it, it's a huge challenge that's got to be addressed, but I think there are, there are really effective and, and reasonable ways to, um, uh, to move this forward. So if I can um, do something that won't happen a lot tonight and quote Elizabeth Warren, we have a plan. Um, so just in really broad strokes, right, we see three phases of the debate. 
you know, right now, what is imperative is to get Democrats and Republicans committing to solve the problem and doing happy things on innovation that get people to say, yes, we're working together, we're making some progress. The next step will be subsidies to encourage deployment. And if you look at, you know, there's this meme in energy policy that, oh, we shouldn't pick technologies. That's crazy talk. Phil Sharp will tell you the only thing Congress likes to do is pick technologies. <laughs> and once they do, they then get willing to spend some money. Look at what happened with 45Q and Senator Barrasso, who's a pretty conservative, don't pick technologies, you know, don't want to tax the public. Well, once he got excited about a couple of technologies, he was more than willing to give them a chance to succeed in the marketplace. So I think you're going to see a middle phase. And the clean energy standard is one version of that kind of deployment. So you'll, you know, I think that stuff's possible. And then you're going to have to see a carbon price. And I think once you've actually built the political capacity to recognize this is not a we win, you lose, and once you actually start to get a little bit of excitement around technology, which is really cool, then I think you'll have the conditions where a carbon price is, is possible. To What's your the timeline for that? Next six to eight years. Oh, yeah, let's all I, get comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, like, that's an answer out of necessity, because if it's not next six to eight years, then it you know, looks like we run out of time. So you know, we wake up every morning and try to figure out. Although people say climate change is a continuum, that it's not black and white. Right. So we shouldn't stop in six to eight years. I totally agree. Unless it's time for some of us to retire. But so like, everyone has their own worldview. And you know, our lane is trying to figure out how you actually create the foundation for that story to become true. Other people have other stories. I think the concern I have is having spent a decade having a pretty reckless debate about the problem, we really can't spend the next decade having a reckless debate about the solution. And that is, you know, I think the motivation is right, the outrage is appropriate, but someone's going to have to help kind of channel that energy towards votes that suburban Democrats and Republicans are willing to take in the next six years, and it's not going to be the Green New Deal. First mention of that, ding, ding, ding. Uh, <laughs> we are the uh, <laughs> great old deal. We take that pride. You know, I, I want to throw it out to you guys in a few minutes, so please be thinking of questions. Any and all questions are welcome. Uh, but first, I want to go very specific on one, one type of greenhouse gas, because I think it's a good microcosm of where we are today, which is methane. Uh, it's a very potent greenhouse gas. It's also the primary component of natural gas, so something all of these men are very familiar with. Uh, so another lightning round question, just raise your hand, or not. Uh, should the federal government directly regulate emissions of methane? <laughs> Yeah. See, only in Washington would somebody laugh when somebody asks that question. <laughs> I'm still in the yes camp. OK, so, so again, I'm going to put on my critic hat. How can you say you want to address climate change if you don't think the government should at least regulate what is ultimately a product that oil and gas companies should want to capture and sell? Well, that was one of those questions I wouldn't have clapped with either yes or no. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, given where, where, you know, where are the chambers. But, the, 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 but there's no question. You know, methane is a serious, serious issue that's got to be addressed. And I think the, you know, the industry itself has stepped up quite a bit to do just that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is when I, I don't think there's a huge debate or, 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 or conflict from either side to say, you know, is this something we should be we should be addressing? Um, uh, I'll, I'll, not to go back in history, and I don't say this to point fingers, but in 2015, I was part of a group that we, you know, we were several associations in the natural gas space working with EPA, where we were ready to say, go ahead and expand the existing regulations on VOCs, which would have which would have dropped methane emissions as well, and we were going to launch a voluntary program, and instead they said, no, we're going to directly regulate methane through the Clean Air Act which we had said, if you do that, we're going to end up in court for years. Unfortunately, we've been in court for years. So I, I, I said, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm, I'm looking at, I think that's another area where we were, we were operating between the 45 yard lines, and we should have been able to come to, here's how we, how, how we address that. The industry has powerful incentives to be able to capture the methane and, 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 and operate more efficiently. They're doing a lot through the environmental partnership and, 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 and other programs that are out there. But well. First of all, there is so much that can be done and is being done on this front. So Williams, we handle, you know, 30% of the nation's natural gas. And since 2012, we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 53%. So a lot can be done on this front. Our, our measure, we're part of One Future, which is a group all the way across the value chain, all the way from the production level, all the way through the LDCs and Southwestern Energy was one of the real proponents of getting this started. A lot of people have joined on. 
That is to say that across that value chain, we'll have less than 1% of loss. Williams portion of that, so the gathering, the processing, and the transmission uh, is allocated, if you will, of that 1%, 0.49%. And today, we as Williams are at 0.09%. So we are four and a half times lower than that number today. And so um, it, you know, this is, this is the kind of opportunity we have. So do we need to regulate? Only thing I would say is perhaps, but make sure you do it in the context of all greenhouse gases and don't just single one particular greenhouse gas out as you do that. But I would just say we are doing a lot and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions today through methane capture. And so, and it's easy to do. So we are doing it. We're making a big difference on it. Do you have to regulate it to get it done? Maybe, but, but um, there's, there's a lot of promise there. Well, I think there's the, the substantive conversation, which of course should be paramount. And I, I think some critics would say that although a lot of the biggest companies are doing that, uh, ExxonMobil just today announced a methane regulatory framework that they hope other companies uh, undertake. Um, but it's a lot of the smaller companies that find it harder or just they just don't want to for cost reasons. Um, so there's that conversation, which is significant. And Alan, if you have any comments on that, um, um, please let me know. But m bigger picture than that, there's this idea that uh, in this very heightened polarized environment, the social license to operate is, is nearly gone for among a lot when it comes to the oil and gas industry. So saying that you, you, can, you can take control of your own emissions and you don't need a government, how, how do you have that position but also try to defend your social license to operate, which going back to our conversations about NIMBYism and permitting and NEPA, I mean, it all fits together that the, the less faith people have, the more they're going to go after you in, in whatever way possible. Yeah, no, I think it's a very fair question. And don't hear me saying, no, I don't think it should be regulated. So that is not what I'm trying to convey. I'm simply saying we are doing a lot already, and there's a lot of opportunity around that. I do agree that policy and regulation ought to favor the people that are trying to do business in a sustainable and right way. And so that we shouldn't have policies that, that incent people and their shareholders to benefit from people not doing things in a sustainable way. And so I think that's one of the most important things. Watching what's going on with the Texas Railroad Commission right now on flaring is a great example of that, where if you are incenting people to, to behave in a way that is not better for the environment, that is not good policy. And so um, so I'm not telling you I think that there should or shouldn't be necessarily regulation around. I'm simply saying you need to take that. You can't, just singling out methane may not be the most effective way of taking emissions on. But I do agree that our policies ought to have the good guys winning, the people that are really trying to do things right. They ought to be favored rather than vice versa. Great. Well, I do want to throw it out to you in the audience. There's some mic runners, uh, so please. Oh. Good. Uh, there's a question over here. Please state your name and, and who you're with. And also, just as importantly, please state your question in the form of a question. Otherwise, I may have to interrupt you. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Ted Weber. I'm an ecologist for Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I'm working on climate adaptation issues. So um, some of you may know that a UN report found that um, a million species are at risk of extinction. Uh, so climate change is a big reason for this, but it's not the only reason. Habitat loss and fragmentation are also um, important reasons. And um, pipelines, transmission lines, roads, linear infrastructure like that are a part of that reason in fragmenting forests and other habitat, uh, causing edge effects and uh, local extinctions. Um, but companies and government agencies um, could cooperate and co-locate some of that linear infrastructure, uh, which would greatly reduce the overall impact. So, um, and it would also save a lot of money, not having to put pipe boys, put these things everywhere. If you look at a map, they're just everywhere. So my question is, um, what about getting a cooperative group together um, to co-locate 
some of this linear infrastructure rather than everyone doing their own thing and um, having this um, web of, of pipelines and power lines and roads everywhere and fragmenting what's left of our natural habitat. If I give a philosophical answer, Alan can then give a substantive one. I mean, the, the philosophical answer is that we have a tradition of local control when it comes to deciding what we build where that is so embedded in the democracy, it's very hard to imagine it changing, and it is fundamentally at odds with a coherent national energy and ecological policy. Because if we had the capacity for a you know, beneficent federal government to step back and say, these are the resources we need, these are the regional benefits, and yes, sorry state in the middle of the country, this one's going through you, but we're gonna, you know, you could then achieve, I think, that goal, and my guess, although I won't speak for Alan, is that the industry would be quite willing to entertain that kind of predictable process. Uh, it's just got these mayors and these governors, and they just keep, they just keep having their own ideas, which is very inconvenient. <laughs> Alan? Yeah, sure. Well, that is a very, it's, it's really important topic. It's a very complex topic. And Jason's absolutely on target with the issue is that, that if we don't, and if you look at the comments that the NPC study made around NEPA reform, one of the things in there is to have a very strong lead agency and have authority for that lead agency. Today, the NEPA process is, is just kind of plants a flag but it is not a comprehensive, the, the way it works today, it is not comprehensive because the state and the local governments come in after the fact and say, oh, well, that's really interesting. You guys came up with a good route that reduces the impact of the environment, but we have our own ideas and we don't have to comply with your NEPA program. That's just for the feds. So it is this conflict between the states and the lack of clear federal lead agency to resolve these issues. And another thing, if you really think about it, and this is one of the things that I, is, I feel I have a lot of sensitivity to, is the issue around eminent domain. So if you think about all the concern around eminent domain today, eminent domain used to not be much of a big deal because there was a market between point A and point B. The lowest cost and the highest you would pay for right away between point A and point B in a linear project was that straight line. As, as policy and permitting has changed and that path gets dictated by these almost, feels like almost infinite number of agencies and stakeholders in the process, as that route gets dictated, you no longer have a market. You have a, you have a dictated route. And so if a custom, or sorry, if, an, if a landowner happens to be on that route, that that is, he can't real, there is no bargaining, that is the route, and for a company to back off of that is another four or five years of a permitting process. And so it has just gotten so difficult to get that. But to answer your question, I think from a Williams perspective and from most of the industry perspective, we would love to use existing corridor um, that's established corridor and, and to utilize that, we would be much in favor. But it's going to take strong lead agency, and so I would, I would suggest that you really look at what we're asking for in the NEPA reform, which I think would get us closer to what you're asking for. Another question? Uh, there, oh, the woman at, and then the guy in the back. I'm going to ask a question <clears throat> which I heard asked by a, a colleague. Can you state your name? Yeah, Sarah Banaszak. Um, of. And I'm with ExxonMobil. And this morning I had a, a colleague ask a great question. I don't know if she's here, so I apologize if I'm preempting. But uh, another uh, a group that's not represented on the stage this morning are the, are the low-income people of the world. And uh, one would argue on, on the one hand with infrastructure, they are uh, likely targeted the most uh, as, as, as accommodating infrastructure and that they may not necessarily benefit from that when that happens. On the, on the other hand, one could argue building more infrastructure, if it truly leads to economic development, might actually help uh, lower income communities. So I'm curious how you would think about those two, two different things to weigh. I would just say as a general principle, in a democracy trying to accelerate the future by harming people in the present is rarely a winning strategy. <laughs> and so I think that the recognition 
that a lot of people are struggling, even in this incredibly <coughs> bountiful economy, which I think is a much broader appreciation now that we're having as a country, is going to have to influence these decisions. I think the um, sense that there is kind of antipathy to the current economy in the service of climate change, I think, is um, unsustainable and not right. And I think in some ways, you know, the, I'll say it again, Green New Deal and the, you know, and again, I, like, I appreciate the fear and the urgency that is driving people to say enough, just shut this stuff down, because they don't see any other path forward. But I don't think that's likely to actually benefit not only the you know, folks uh, working paycheck to paycheck, but any of the rest of us. And so I do think that there has to be some metaphor beyond green jobs that shows a path forward for regions of the country that are going to suffer in this transition. And rather than pretending they won't, regions of the country are going to suffer in this transition. And that's going to have to be part of the acknowledgment when we come to a national solution. Yeah, I would just add, you know, if you take New York, for example, today, and the desire to get infrastructure into New York right now, the cost of electric uh, power on a, on a BTU basis delivered to a resident is four and a half times more expensive than natural gas. And the people that are making the argument that, well, we should just electrify New York, we're only, today there's only 4% of the power, of the electric power, being provided by wind and solar in that market. So until we are to a point where we satisfied 100% of that electric load with renewables, we can't even start to butt into the, to the heating load in that area. And we're telling people, even though there won't be emissions reduction with the accomplishment, you should pay four and a half times more for your heating source. I don't think that is a, I don't think that is a very practical approach. And it's certainly not good for the environment despite the fact that people believe it is. So I think we've got to make sure that we make it loud and clear what the opportunities are in terms of both cost to individuals um, as well as the emission reduction opportunities that really exist for us today. But I, I, I do think that that is one of the things that's missing in the debate today is other people dictating how much you should pay for your power, whether you can afford it or not. And I think we really need to bring that to light. Thank you. Question in the back. Hi, uh, Chris Knight with Argus Media. This is a question for Alan. Um, so as you know, uh, Williams recently canceled the Constitution Pipeline in New York. Can you give us a little bit more color about, I mean, you guys were talking about developing that project and then suddenly it changed. Can you give us color on why it changed? And then secondly, why is the dynamic going to be any different for Northeast Supply Enhancement Project, which also has the Section 401 water permitting problems that Constitution had? Yeah, thank you. Well, in the end, in the end, the Constitution issue uh, really changed during that process because uh, states to the south and loads to the south were very anxious to have those gas supplies. And so we developed three other projects while Constitution was being blocked. We developed three other large, even larger supply projects to the south. So the southeast states will enjoy that low-cost fuel supply. The northeast states in New England will continue to be deprived by it and pay three to four times more for their gas supplies. And that's a political decision that was made. At the end of the day, we're going to, as a company, we're going to go where, where the best economics allow us to go. And the fact is that while that was being stopped, new projects to the south were developed in a way that that was not the best risk-adjusted return available for us. As to Nessie, I would just say that Nessie is a little more direct and obvious in terms of the need for New York. And so Constitution perhaps wasn't as obvious in terms of that need. But National Grid has now come out with a study. And I think it clearly shows that the best solution uh, for meeting the needs there of New York uh, is, from a, both an emission standpoint and an economic perspective, is Nessie. And hopefully, uh, that those circumstances will prevail. So, but thank you for the question. I think I see a question in the back. Yep. And then we'll go you and then this gentleman. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Das. I work on the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee in uh, the U.S. House of Representatives. So I have a question for you all about your perceptions on um, the, how the House has been, how well the House has been doing in working on these energy policy innovation ideas. So we've talked a lot about the Senate bill 
um, and the provisions contained in there. You know, this is kind of my day-to-day -day world because I'm, I'm working on those bills, but I would love to know what your three perspectives are on that specific topic. Can I go first? Yeah. Sure. I, well, first of all, uh, thank you. Because I think, the, the, from, from our perspective, the science, science committee's actually we've been, been working in a very effective, constructive way. You increase the authorization for ARPA-E, which I think is you know, broadly supported. Certainly, we support it, sent up you know, letters of support for that. And we know that you're, you're working on the same, same type, the, the innovation bills that are now finding their way to the floor in the Senate are, you know, are uh, a lot of constructive work going on in the Science Committee and other committees in the House. So we're, we're hopeful that as we get the, the momentum coming out of the Senate will allow us to put together the package you know, needed to, you know, to, to get it through the House as well. Yeah, I, I would just amplify that. I think you know, most of the provisions, and you wouldn't say this, but I'll say it on your behalf, in the Senate bill were actually initially debated and generated in the House because the House just gets to move faster because it doesn't have to deal with the other party. Um, but they were done in a, I think, thoughtful enough way that actually they were accessible on the Senate side. So I think a lot of the Democratic leadership in the House you know, really took advantage of the opportunity to move those pieces forwards. You then had the context of you know, energy and commerce trying to at least lay out what the trajectory of you know, zero or near zero, net zero by 50 looks like. And I think that was a, you know, a useful exercise for them to put that down because it shows both the possibility but also how hard it is. Right? There are a lot of white spaces left in that legislative approach. And I think there's a little bit of a drum roll about what the select committee is able to um, produce, it being both given incredible focus but no real authority. And so they're kind of grappling, I think. So I mean, I think between those three entry points, between what the you know, committee work is happening, how science, between the kind of big picture of ENC and this mandate to describe a broad solution, you know, I think the House is generating a lot of the intellectual capital that uh, is going to move the process forward. I think we have time for one more question here. The gentleman, uh, yep, yep, you, yeah. Uh, Sean there's, a there's a mic. Sean Sullivan, I'm a reporter with S&P Global. Um, the Northeast uh, has kind of told the gas industry and the pipelines, uh, we don't want you here. And there have been um, fights over permitting. There have been gas bans, recent gas bans. Uh, Alan, what is the path forward for the pipeline industry in the Northeast? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would say, uh, while it's uh, not uh, the current narrative, the fact is that the majority of power produced today in the state of New York, for instance, is natural gas. And so while that may not be the narrative people want to hear, and in fact, if you look at what wind and solar did from 17 to 19, the, uh, the demand went up from about 128 trillion BTUs to 133 trillion BTUs from 17 to 19. So do the math on that, that's, uh, that's 5 trillion BTUs and, on, and, and less than 1 trillion BTUs of new power came from that. Uh, from wind and solar in that process. And so we're not even keeping up with, we're not even keeping up with the power increases that are occurring in that time frame with new, um, new uh, renewables. And so we have to find a way to continue to utilize natural gas. 24% today still of the heating source in New York, in the state of New York, 24% is still coming mostly from heating oil and refinery gases. And so those are much heavier hydrocarbon content than natural gas. And so we have that opportunity still to reduce emissions uh, there in the state. And why we wouldn't take advantage of that and build infrastructure to take, to take advantage of that makes no sense to me, other than the fact that it's become politically popular and almost religious to say no fossil fuels despite the amount of emissions reductions that can be accomplished with it. So I would just tell you, yeah, it's a fight. The good news is I would tell you a lot of demand growth going on in the rest of the country and, and globally. And from an you know, infrastructure provider standpoint, we're going to go where the market uh, demands those resources and where we can build the infrastructure to serve it. Well, I have one more lightning round question for the panelists um, before I hand things back to Sasha for a quick uh, wrap up. Uh, so what percent chance, so this is not a raise of hands, this is a one to zero percent to hundred percent. What percent chance do you see Congress having a serious and substantive 
a debate on climate and energy policy next Congress? Well, the word serious is joyfully vague enough, but I would say, uh, you know, 87.5. <laughs> Please know that this is not me asking them whether or not I think they think it will pass, which is very different. Marty? I'll go a little, a little less optimistic and say 75%. This is kind of like the price is right. And yeah. if you, if you $1. Dollar. I get to pick the middle. No, no. Perfect. I have two experts, and I get to pick the middle of those points. That's what I'll take. So. That's what you take? Yes, I'll take the 80, whatever that is, 82, whatever that is, yeah. Well, I want to say thank you to the panelists, and thank you to the audience for and those online. And I'll... Hand it back to Sasha. And, and Sasha, while you jump up, just a point of personal privilege to acknowledge and thank uh, Marshall and Jim and the leadership of the NPC. They're actually sustaining an evidence-based process in a fact-free society, which is not a simple task. And um, I enjoyed participating, so thank you. All right, great. Well, uh, that was just a remarkable conversation with really four really thoughtful uh, thought leaders on these issues. And so that was really great to be a part of that. Um, and again, um, thank you to your participation. Um, one, one thing I, I, you know, I think to step back and kind of look at where we are now in this conversation, it's been 15 years since the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and then 10 years since the conversation that really kind of came to a head around climate and the Wax and Markey Bill. It's really hard to believe that we're still having this conversation today. I mean, I think we all sort of thought at this point we'd be a little further along. And, my sense is that, one, things have changed a lot from, from that period of time to now. And I think based on what we've heard today and some of the new voices that we see coming into this conversation, I think we have some reason now for new optimism going forward. As Jason said, we're no longer arguing about the problem. It's really kind of how do we, um, how, how do we solve the problem, which I think is a very important pivot now in the conversation. And I think one of the other lessons is these political windows, they don't they don't open very often and they don't stay open for very long. So I think we really need to get very serious now about how we can find the political will and the ability to work together, you know, in a bipartisan way to actually take advantage of what I think, you know, we heard here and I th my, my view I share is there's a high likelihood we're going to see some engagement in Congress in the next couple of years on these issues and we really need to try to get busy and, and find the way to work together to make some progress. So. Anyway, that's the final thought here. Thank you to our panel. Uh, thanks, Amy, for leading us through that conversation. And thanks to all of you for sitting with us.